going to talk about the ICD-10 so that is part of the universal codes and uh, then we'll move on to claim submission uh, topic where we discuss about uh, two ways of submitting the claim one is uh, encounter submission and the one is claim submitted by the member so there are two ways to uh, submit a claim and then once the claim is submitted the next step is to adjudicate the claim so we'll see what is adjudication and what are the activities that will that will be done during adjudication and the next topic is the edits and validation which is uh, when you're doing the adjudication you you will have certain validation points and uh, edits are nothing but the error uh, or the mistakes done on the claim some of the examples of edits and how the validations will happen and finally we'll uh, look at the claim process flow so it's it's a uh, workflow kind of a uh, representation of how claim moves uh, from intake to event and all so we'll look at that so that gives an overview of uh, the claim workflow so we'll look at that at the end once we discuss about claim adjudication so quickly moving to first one which is icd 10 icd 10 is the 10th revision of uh, international statistical classification of diseases so icd stands for international classification of disease and uh, it and related health problems so it's a medical classification list by world health organization it codes for disease signs and symptoms abnormal findings compliance social circumstances and external causes of injury or diseases so icd-10 is a pretty a pretty much exhaustive list the earlier version was icd-9 and uh, with icd-9 we were uh, missing some of the uh, symptoms some of the diseases uh, names and all so to in order to incorporate all those things and in order to enhance the present codes whatever codes we have in icd-9 uh, they don't have the clarity and all so in order to increase the clarity in the codes they have come up with the 10th revision of the icd uh, international classification of diseases this 10th revision was uh, recently introduced and uh, most of the projects in health insurance domain right now are around icd-10 and majority of the health insurance companies already uh, migrated themselves and uh, migrated their systems to icd-10 compatible so the changes occurred in both diagnosis and procedure codes we have two categories under icd one is diagnosis other one is the procedure code uh, with 10th revision i diagnosis codes increased uh, from 14000 to 68000 so there's a drastic increase in the diagnosis codes and uh, even the length of the code has increased previously it was only five character now excuse now they have increased it to seven character so the, even the length has been increased and the modifiers are increased so it, it's all about code earlier when uh, if it is some uh, treatment related to hand uh, there was only one code now they have uh, variations in the same uh, treatment for the hand um, for the left hand for the right hand for the arm and for the shoulder so there are variations came in and with that variation more clarity came into picture so such kind of uh, uh, clarity has made the codes to increase from 14,000 to 68,000 even the procedure codes you, they have been increased from 13,000 to 85,000 codes so even at the procedure side also uh, they have given more clarity and the codes have been changed uh, or revised so with that revision there is a vast increase in the number of codes and and this is uh, just uh, 
a mandate given by World Health Organization saying that everyone, uh, every health insurance company and uh, every provider or the hospital should follow this ICD-10 coding. And there is a deadline to implement this. Uh, it is October 1st, 2014, which is this year. Earlier deadline was uh, last year, October 1st. Uh, they changed it because uh, most of the health insurance organizations have uh, complex IT systems which need to be updated and uh, everyone made a request that uh, uh, it needs to be extended by one year so then the government has and the world health organization has come up and said that the deadline is October 1st, 2014. By that time, everyone should be using ICD-10 codes and ICD-9 codes will not be used for any future claims. And all HIPAA-covered entities must make the change, which means any any entity which falls under the HIPAA regulation should uh, ensure that they have this change in place. Any questions on ICD-10? So, sir, right now ICD-9 is in implementation? Uh, ICD-9 is already uh, implemented and it has been used in all the health insurance companies. 10 came yeah, in the picture. Yeah, yeah but uh, ICD-10 deadline mm -hmm. is uh, this year. Yes. So, it should be, it, sh it will, deadline as in, it will implement, start implementing from First October or what? Uh, deadline in a sense, uh, all the systems should be hundred percent compatible with the new codes. Oh. Okay. Let's say you have a uh, system which uh, which is used to key the claims. You have a yeah. application where you can key the claims. So right now you can key in uh, only ICD nine codes. Because okay. of this mandate, uh, you should be able to key in the ICD-10 codes. Just a simple example where uh, there is a field where you give the diagnosis code. You, the length you have the system defined as 5 characters, but ICD-10 codes are 7 digits. So you need to make change in your system to, in, to increase the field length and even from the database side and all. So th those changes should be there by October 1st, 2014. So these kind okay. of changes uh, needs to be made by the health insurance company itself. Okay. All the systems that they are going to use should be compatible with ICD-10 codes by October 1st, 2014. And right now uh, they are using both the codes, ICD-9 and ICD-10. And from October 1st, they, they should be using only ICD-10. Any questions? No. Clear on the ICD-10 part. Not sorry. So I am clear with the ICD-10. Okay. So when you get a project on uh, ICD-10 conversions or ICD-10 migration, so the basic uh, fundamentals that you should be aware of is what was the ICD-9 code and what are the corresponding ICD-10 codes which means you should have a mapping between previous version and the pre present version, 9th and 10th. Mm -hmm. So when you're working on certain application which is accepting the ICD-10, then you should uh, see whether the previous claims which were keyed in before October 1st, uh, if that is having ICD-9 code, you should have that mapping. So map, ICD-9 okay. to 10 mapping is important and it was there in the World Health Organization website. These are pretty much standard uh, codes. And these are not specific to US. These are specific to the entire uh, uh, world, any country. 
should use the same okay. IC report. It's an international classification, so it is not specific to US or some other country. This is for uh, all the countries around the world. Okay. Yes. Uh, can I move to the next topic? So, so far we talked about claim intake. Uh, in the claim intake, we have seen the claim forms and then uh, moved on to uh, the universal codes and all. Then uh, we, uh, the next topic is the claim submission. There are two ways to submit a claim. One is the uh, claim submitted by the provider and the claim submitted by the member. So claim submitted by the provider is called as encounter. An encounter is a healthcare visit of any type by an enrollee to a provider of care or services. So if the member is visiting any hospital or an individual doctor, that event is called as encounter. And encounter claim is submitted by the provider that records services rendered by the provider. So encounter claims are provider claims, which means these claims are submitted by the doctor himself um, with the services taken by the provider I mean the claim or the encounter claim will have all the details all the services provided by the member and HMOs use encounter report to track utilization of services so in order to track uh, a particular service utilization HMOs use the encounter reports encounter is nothing but an, any other claim only difference is it is submitted by the provider so if you go to any uh, hospital where there is a health insurance wing, what they do is uh, when you check into the hospital, they'll uh, take your policy ID and uh, other details and they'll take care of the claim process, which means they'll submit the claim and they'll take care of entire uh, claim administration processing and all. So in that case, uh, member involvement will be very less and even the services taken and the amounts charged and all all those details will be filled by the hospital uh, staff itself if that is an insurance wing and if it is an individual provider in some cases the providers will do it so it's called as an encounter claim and the other one is a claim submitted by member so in some cases the member uh, himself or herself will submit the claims uh, those cases are something like out of network claims if you are going to a hospital which is not listed in your policy document so in that case that hospital will not be taking care of your claim process so in such scenario the member need to fill in the claim form and submit it to the health insurance company and even in case of emergency uh, Emergen during emergency you will visit uh, you can visit any hospital so if you are visiting any out of network hospital or some hospital which is not uh, not at all related to your health insurance policy in that case you might have to submit your claim on your own so only in those cases uh, claims will be submitted by the member and in this case all the details uh, will be filled in by the member so in order to fill in the details, they should have uh, uh, the number of services taken, the charges and all the bills should be with the member when submitting the claim. So two ways to submit the claim. Most of the claims will be encounter submissions. Uh, so very few percentage of the claims are submitted by the member. Any questions on claim submission? So, what is this out of network claims? Uh, out of network. Uh, you remember we talked about yeah, the I mean under and out of network, right? Yeah. So, if you have taken services uh, from an out of network hospital, mm. okay. Let's say you have taken services from an out of network hospital. Out of network is hospital which is not listed in your policy document you will have a mm -hmm. list of hospital where you can go and take the services 
if you have gone and taken the services from a hospital which is not listed in your policy document it will be a out of network uh, hospital and the services that you have taken will not be covered as part of your policy fully or partially so that depends on the policy and you have taken the services and now you wanted to claim the amount that you have spent on the on those medical expenses but in order to do that uh, that hospital will not be uh, taking care of your claim processing because it is an out of network it does not have contract with your health insurance company so in that case mm -hmm. you have to fill in the claim form on your own and submit it to the health insurance company saying that uh, i have taken so and so services from uh, so and so hospital on this date and these are the expenses and uh, submit the claim to health insurance company then health insurance company will come come into picture and do the adjudication and determine how much amount uh, they need to pay and how much amount the member need to pay and all so these things will be calculated because the services are taken from an out of network uh, hospital the claim that you submit is called as out of network claim okay okay so uh, so i'm sure then encounter submission is more expensive than uh, this claim submission by member no it is not expensive uh, here the member will not be involved because you can you can go for a cashless uh, facility where you don't carry any uh, money with you you just go and check into the hospital and show the yeah. health insurance card and when you yeah. give the health insurance card to the hospital staff they'll take care of the entire claim process they'll fill in your details and based on the services that they have given they'll apply that claiming and all so here uh, the member can relax and the member should should not be worrying about uh, claim details filling and submitting it to the health insurance company the reason is uh, this hospital is having contract with the health insurance company that uh, you have buy, we have bought the policy so they both will take care of the claiming and all so you don't need to worry about claim processing and all in case of an encounter because everything okay. is taken care by the provider okay 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 so far any questions on this claim submission and claim intake no sir so i am clear Moving to the next one, which is uh, claims adjudication. So adjudication is nothing but uh, validating the claim. So you'll be validating on various uh, parameters. So here are the parameters that uh, I have listed. First thing uh, you will validate is the compliance check, whether the which is based on the claim form. So whether you have used the correct form and the details in the claim form or correct uh, valid or not so if you are using 837 iep hcfa and cms 1500 whatever form that you are using it should be in compliant with the uh, latest standard format so if it is not matching with the standard format then that claim will be rejected and will be sent back to the person whoever is submitted whether it is a provider or member and the notification will go to them and uh, the notification will say that so and so sections are not valid please correct and send it back so that kind of compliance check will be done and the next validation is the policy coverage so whenever you submit a claim the uh, you will enter the policy details the policy number and when you have taken the policy policy start date and the expiry date so all these details will be uh, entered in the claim so during adjudication what they'll do is uh, they'll see if the policy is still active or not so the policy should be active uh, on the date that you have taken the services 
so let's say you have taken services on uh, july 1st and your policy is expiring on july 2nd so it is a valid claim because you have taken services before the policy expires but if you have taken the services after july 2nd july 2nd is when your policy is expiring and you have taken services on july 5th then that claim will not be valid because your policy has already been ex expired and whatever services you have taken after that will be considered as uh, ineligible uh, services so you cannot claim for those services and all so policy coverage uh, is taken into consideration uh, based on the expiry date and also uh, there will be a validation with your policy document so your policy document will have the list of services uh, that will be covered uh, as part of your, your uh, health insurance policy or plan so if your service that you have taken is not falling under that those list of services that are there in the document then your claim will be rejected if the service is there in the claim uh, policy document or insurance plan document then it will be covered so one is the services other one is the expiry date so these two will be validated as part of policy coverage uh, which will be validated using the information that you have given in the claim uh, using the policy number and the dates and the based on the policy number they can get the list of services that will be covered that is one thing uh, the other one is a member eligibility and demographics so member eligibility uh, is determined uh, based on the patient details that we are we have given so patient details we will give uh, patient assistant date of birth uh, which will determine the age and demographic in the sense and the locality where the patient is living so in some policy or plan document they'll also mention the locality for certain services certain services will be covered in only a few locations but not in all locations so such kind of uh, uh, constraints will be there in the plan document so these things will these things will be validated and if the members age is more than 65 uh, such members will not be eligible for certain uh, services so all these kind of constraints if it is there in the policy document then they'll enforce these constraints and based on that they'll determine whether the claim is valid or not clear so far on the policy and member eligibility any questions no sir so first form will be checked then the policy data and the member data the next one is the provider information so where uh, in the claim form you give the provider identifier which is the uh, national provider identifier and the provider address and the provider name and all so who has given you the services like the hospital name and address so based on that uh, the health insurance company will determine uh, whether this provider is in network or out of network this determination is important because uh, based on the status of the provider the benefits will change if it is in network your benefits will be higher if it is out of network your benefits will be lower and these benefit uh, definitions are will be given in the policy document so they might say that if it is in network you will be reimbursed 100 percent if it is out of network you will be reimbursed only with uh, 50 percent so such kind of uh, uh, differentiation will be made in the policy document and those things will be validated when you are uh, doing the claim adjudication and the fifth one is the diagnosis information which uh, checks about the diagnosis that is given to the patient so it should be valid uh, as i as i mentioned in the last session the same example if some pregnancy related diagnosis is done on a male uh, male patient that is not a valid uh, diagnosis information so they'll check for the diagnosis information whether it is valid or not so the next section which is fraud check on diagnosis is related to the same thing so they'll do a fraud check if it is a 
valid diagnosis for the patient or not if it is not then it will fail in the fraud check and it will be denied the claim will be denied or rejected and the next one is the medical necessity so there are cases where providers will uh, bill uh, the health insurance company unnecessarily so they list out uh, various services which are not necessary for the particular uh, disease so in that case also they will do the medical necessity check what they'll do is they'll take the list of services that have been uh, uh, written on the claim and check if these are valid services or not valid services in the sense uh, if the doctor is has given treatment to uh, a patient who is suffering from headache if the doctor has given some treatment on the stomach which is not a necessary treatment for the headache so that will be a unnecessary treatment given by the doctor and it it has been billed by the doctor then uh, that that services will be rejected and a notification will go to the provider saying that these services are not medically necessary and we are not going to consider these services for the reimbursement purpose so that kind of check will also be done whether it is medically necessary or not and the next one is a COB check which stands for uh, coordination of benefits uh, coordination of benefits in the sense uh, pe some of the people will have uh, dual plans like they'll be having two health insurance plans what happens in that case and all so they should not be claiming twice so let's say you have a thousand dollar bill health insurance bill uh, or the health care bill and you cannot claim the same thousand dollars in both the health plans which will make you get uh, around two thousand dollars so th that is not a, a good practice or a valid practice you should be claiming in only one of the health plan and if it is pending from one of the health insurance company you can claim the remaining amount from the other health insurance company so which defines the coordination of benefits so uh, this is a separate topic i'll take care of this topic in coming up session but for now to determine the payments they'll uh, ensure that the patient has uh, uh, if the patient has multiple plans they will ensure that the benefits are coordinated between the two health plans instead of duplicating the benefits and the next one is a pre-authorization or referral check uh, if it is a HMO you need to get a referral or pre-authorization from the primary care physician so for some services this is mandatory getting the pre-authorization so during the adjudication they will also check for the pre-authorization whether the pre-authorization form is there or not uh, whether the referral has been given by the PCP or not so these things will be validated and the last one is a duplicate claim check there will be cases where uh, members will be submitting uh, duplicate claims like submitting the same details again and again so these kind of duplicate claims will be validated if it is falling on the same dates or same services have been rendered so these things will be validated during the education so out of all uh, there are more validations will happen but these are some of the major validations that uh, health insurance companies does uh, during the claim education so any questions on uh, the validation points so what is referral check uh, sorry what was that referral check referral okay so when you uh, visit a hospital the first your first contact person will be the pcp primary care physician mm -hmm. so based on the initial diagnosis the primary care physician will refer to you as we will, will refer uh, you to a specialist based on the initial diagnosis so this yeah. referral uh, is mandatory for some of the health insurance plans like hmo in hmo this referral is mandatory so without referral oh. if you visit any specialist and taken the services those things will not be reimbursed unless there is a referral okay so you should get the referral and uh, provide the referral details also in the claim form 
so if if there is a referral they'll check for the referral uh, data in the claim who has given you the referral and all whether it is a valid referral or not so only if it is a valid referral they'll uh, give you the reimbursements clear any yes, question sir. okay so can i move to the next slide okay so overall adjudication is nothing but uh, checking the data on the claim and determining whether the data is valid or not so during that validation during adjudication so we'll will be uh, coming up with a lot of errors in the claim uh, data so which uh, in the health insurance terminology they call it as edit uh, it is called as edit because there is some editing required for those errors and all so edits are the criteria that if unmet will prompt further investigation of a claim so if you are not meeting certain criteria then you will get an edit and you need further investigation or editing on the claim so edit is an automated claim processing system in effect kick out kick out claims for further review so if if it is if there is an automated claim processing system so any errors that are coming from the claim adjudication are called are called as edit and these claims will be kicked out of the claim processing engine for further review that means you need a manual intervention to correct that data let's say you have submitted a claim where you have given the member date of birth wrong so when you submit it to the claim processing system what this claim processing system does is it will interact with the member database based on the ssn it will check for the date of birth if it is not matching it will mark the date of birth as an edit and it will kick out the claim from the claim processing system and sends a notification to the provider or member uh, saying that uh, date of birth is not matching with the system record you need to correct the date of birth so that kind of notification will go to the person whoever submitted the claim and to give an example an edit may be triggered by missing or conflicting information so if there is a conflicting information also the edits will will be given so a diagnosis code for tonsillitis and a treatment code for tonsillitis illogical responses or codes contained on a claim form so if there is any uh, code which is not logical uh, in terms of medical uh, terminology like a maternity benefit for a male which is not a logical thing so this will come out as an edit or treatments or procedures that are not covered by the health plan so if the service that you have taken is not covered by your health plan then that will also be uh, coming as an edit saying that this is an invalid service that you are claiming uh, services like cosmetic surgeries will not be covered under your health plan and if you are submitting a claim for the cosmetic surgery then you will be uh, uh, i mean that claim will be kicked out of the system and saying that uh, it is it has some edits because the services are not covered or the data is not correct you need to correct that kicked out in the sense it will be denied or rejected and there will be other edits such as verification of member eligibility are based on the steps in the claim decision process including edits for prior authorization which is the referral and appropriateness of medical care which is nothing but the medical necessity so whatever uh, bullet points that we discussed in this slide if anything is not matching or anything is failing the criteria then that will come out as an edit and the claim will be denied or rejected by the system and corresponding notification will go to the person whoever submitted the claim so anything that is not meeting the criteria that is an edit and edits are programmed into the health plans claim processing system so you you have uh, uh, 
claim processing systems or the engines which does all these kinds of validations so you just need to submit the claim and in electronic format when you submit that it goes to uh, the claim processing system the claim processing system will have the programs the software programs which will do the validations and all these edits are programmed in that so if anything is not meeting the criteria then it will throw that edit uh, to the person and sends the notification for corrections so that's about edits and validation any questions on that no sir is clear right yes sir okay now we have seen uh, how to submit the claim claim intake and submission and we also seen what exactly we do in claim adjudication now we'll look at the claim process flow how the claim workflow is in a real time so this gives a pretty much uh, uh details about how the claim uh flows from a member uh, to sp sponsor or the employer or payer or insurance company and the provider how each stakeholder is related in the claim so the process starts uh, when an event has occurred that requires member to take services from provider an event occurred in the sense uh, if a member is suffering from a disease or member met with an accident so that will be an event uh, and the claim process starts uh, when that event has occurred so the member will visit the provider to take some services the first thing uh, the member does is member goes to the provider for services this is called an encounter so member visiting the provider for some services is called encounter and here the provider provider provides service to the member and files a claim to the payer for payment so this is encounter claim so the doctor will provide the services and doctor will uh, submit the claim on behalf of the member for the services that the doctor has given and from here the insurance company uh, which is in contract with the provider the relationship between these two is payer has contracted with the provider to provide services to its members so this provider is in network because this provider is in contract with the payer or the insurance company and at the same time you can see the relation between member and the insurance company is member is enrolled under plan as a member subscriber or dependent for the plan sold to the sponsor so if uh, the doctor is submitting this uh, claim the member should be enrolled with this insurance company and even the payer should be in contract with the insurance company these two are the prerequisites to submit the claim so these two should be there uh, when the provider submits the claim what the insurance company does is uh, it will uh, adjudicate the claim and determine the benefits and based on the determination it will pay to the provider and if there is any expenses uh, given by the member then it will reimburse to the member as well and this is one set of category where a uh, member enrolled to enrolled in the insurance company and all uh, but there is another stakeholder which is a sponsor or the employer this one comes when you have taken a group insurance plan or when the member is a um, uh, part of an uh, employee employer organization and the health insurance policy is taken through the employer then these two sections will come in place so in in that case member gets the benefits through the sponsor wherein member may be a subscriber or a general member so in this case uh, member will uh, will be enrolling to the policy through the employer and the employer will be getting the policy from insurance company so where the insurance company sells the health plan to the sponsor with defined benefits uh in lieu of uh, premium amounts to be paid by the sponsor so in this case uh, the sponsor will be the employer whereas if the member is enrolled on uh on their own then the premium will be paid by the member himself and 
everything will be taken care and every transaction will be between member and health insurance company but in case of an employer uh, sponsored health insurance plan then the transactions will be routed through the employer so this is an another step uh, in case of a group insurance plan so the process remains the same member visits the provider provider gives the services and provider will submit the claim and here the adjudication will happen and the amounts that should be paid to the member will be determined here uh, by the insurance company that's all about the claim process any questions on this this is just to explain uh, how each stakeholder is involved in the claim processing I have to doubt. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, tell me. So I'm saying I have no doubt. Sorry? I have no doubt. For this oh, no doubt. So yes. I thought I thought you said I have a doubt. Okay. No, no. So next thing is uh, when you when the adjudication is happening uh, after uh, all the details are validated in the whatever details that uh, the member or the provider given on the claim the next part is determining the benefits I mean how much amount uh, we need to pay to the member or the provider and all this is determined based on uh, certain cost related components like copay coinsurance and all so in the next session I'll discuss about those component cost sharing components and we'll also do some hands-on on that uh, based on the copay we'll determine the amounts and all we'll take the some what you call use cases and try to do the calculation that is our next session's agenda and after that after the health insurance company determines the payment based on these cost sharing components then they'll roll out the checks or make the payments and all that is the final step in claim life cycle so so far we are in the middle of validating the data of the claim so we have seen how to submit the claim what forms we need to use and what are all the codes that we need to use uh, when we are submitting the claim and who can submit the claim uh, we have seen that provider can do that even the member can do in certain special cases where they take services from out of network or emergency services member can also submit the claim and once it is submitted uh, uh, it will go to the adjudication engine where certain validations are happening so validation on your claim form validation on your member date member data uh, validation on the provider data policy data uh, validation on the services that you have taken and the codes that you have entered in the claim and even the validation on the referral if there is a referral mandate then validation will be done on that and there is a validation on the duplicate claim so what they'll do is they'll just check the history of your entire uh, medical claims and see if there is a duplicate claim so you cannot uh, claim for the same service on the same date twice so which will be a duplicate claim so any any edit or any uh, deviation from the specified criteria will be rejected by the health insurance company and uh, it will come back to the member or the provider as a uh, notification for changes if it is a valid uh, mistake then they can make changes and submit it and if, if it is uh, not uh, being changed or if it is a real fraud case then they may not consider the claim and they may not be reimbursing the claim and all the four entities will be involved uh, the member provider sponsor and the payer all four entities will be involved in the entire claim process
any questions on today's topics or the topics covered so far from day 1 no sir okay apart from going through these slides i suggest you to go through uh, internet and try to find more information on the code claim forms and other terminology as well because it's a vast topic and you need to uh, be thorough with the current trend so like i said today i have we have discussed on icd and whatever we discussed is just the basic i mean there are more details on icd as I, as we have seen there are thousands of codes you can just go through uh, some of the codes and see the difference between icd 9 and 10 so what is the basic difference you can take any one code and see the mapping between icd 9 and 10 uh, so that will give you a detailed information on what changes that they have made and what is the need for uh, revi revising the icd codes so the need is uh, having more new disease diseases uh, came up in the last 10 years and having more uh, clarity do they have to revise the codes so you can get more details on icd10 uh, in who website so try uh, searching in the internet for more information then you will be having the more uh, clarity on these topics so whatever we are discussing on the classes uh, will not be uh, sufficient if you are working on a icd10 project you need to get more de more details on the icd10 ICD-10 topic itself is a very vast topic. So based on the projects you get, you can go and search. But if you have more interest on this topic, then you can always go and search in the internet and find out more data. Clear so far? Any questions? No doubt. Sorry? No doubt okay so i'll share this presentation uh, today's presentation